First of all, I have a very uh, significant presentation from uh, Martin Bowles, the Secretary of the Australian Department of Health. Now, Martin, uh, previous to uh, taking on this current role in 2014, I think, had been in a very interesting and difficult area, the Secretary for Immigration and Border Protection. And, uh, Wow, you've, you've got courage. Um, and prior to that, was in the, uh, has worked in the New South Wales and Queensland health systems. Um, he was awarded the Public Service Medal in 2012, um, and uh, given his portfolios, I'm not surprised. Um, he, when he took over in the health area, he said he intended to steward a system under strain. Uh, and interesting, given Julie uh, Pantidosi's comment before about what is the definition of leadership, that use of the word steward I, I thought was a very telling word um, because that really is what I guess we all try to do. And when he was uh, appointed to the role he said uh, it is our role to gather intelligence on what is working and what is not, what is happening, what are the interdependencies and of course I come to our theme collaboration, integration and partnership, what are the interdependencies in our system and what are we doing about them. So, Martin, we are really looking forward to hearing you this morning. Would you please welcome Martin Bowles, Secretary of the Australian Department of Health. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Lynn. Can I uh, firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present? Can I also acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here with us today? Uh, look, it's a great pleasure to be, uh, to be here with the leadership of ambulance services across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it is uh, a fundamental issue within the health system uh, and you are at that front line. I'm, I'm going to roam around a few different topics uh, this morning and uh, very happy to take questions. Uh, even if you want to talk about immigration, because that was a fascinating time. Uh, I'm not sure courageous would be what I'd just, maybe stupid might be a better way of describing me. Uh, but look, uh, when we generally talk about touch points in the health system, uh, we talk about GPs, we talk about pharmacists, we talk about hospitals. Uh, but for the millions and millions of people every year who are in need of some form of emergency care, uh, the touch point that really sticks out is ambulance. Uh, I think Australians do have a profound appreciation for the ambulance services. Uh, they're constantly in the top number in any of the community surveys as the most trusted profession. Always up there, doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, always up there, uh, right up there at number one, two or three. Departmental secretaries, secretaries of departments like mine, I don't know where we rate. I don't want to know, really, because I'm sure we won't be up there with uh, paramedics, that's for sure. Um, as for uh, your frontline role, you do see all sorts of people. People with mental health, you see the frail elderly people who've just had a fall or, or some sort of illness. You might see someone who's had a stroke at home, need to get to uh, their point of care as soon as possible. The asthmatic child, the motor vehicle accident, and I have to say one of my favourites is the home handyman who uh, may have had an accident trimming the hedge or something like that. Which sort of leads me to a bit of a story from last weekend. My daughter gets married on Saturday and uh, uh, my wife, uh, always vigilant about things that need to be doing around the house, had me up trimming hedges, the top of a ladder, it was raining, there was a 90, 90 uh, kilometre hour wind that was howling through. Here I am, top of the ladder, trying to get the hedges looking nice for the wedding day. Uh, so I think uh, if I had fallen, and she kept reminding me, don't slip, don't do this, the wedding's on Saturday. It wasn't about how well I was going to be at the end of falling. But our system is a very good system. Uh, as, as you heard, I, I, I ran immigration for a while. I travelled to many countries across the world and I talked to health systems uh, because that was part of uh, what we were trying to do, even in the immigration space. And I have to say, if I was going to be sick anywhere in the world, I want it to be here. And that goes to if I'm going to have that accident and if I had fallen off my uh, ladder on the weekend, I want that to be here and nowhere else. 
because the ambulance services in this country, albeit we have problems from time to time, are second to none. And I think we really do talk ourselves down sometimes uh, across health more broadly about how good we actually are. We do a lot of work with the OECD and the World Health Organisation. And you know, while we're not a big country, if I was to pitch us anywhere as a country of influence, we are in the top three, without doubt in my mind. We actually figure quite prominently in all of those things. That said, we are a system under pressure. You see that pressure every single day as you wait to get people into, into the hospital system. Um, but what we're, we, we need to really build for sustainability. We're seeing increase in, in chronic and complex conditions where one, you know, one in two people have a form of chronic illness. One in four or five these days have two or more. The older we get, the more chances we have of having chronic illness. We have an increase in our ageing population, which is giving us a twofold hit. We're living longer, we're needing more treatments, we're finding different ways to treat people, and we've got a workforce problem because there are less people working to keep uh, the aged population going. Technology, and I'll touch on technology a bit through, through this morning, because I, uh, our, our estimate is it is probably about 65 to 70 per cent of the cost growth in healthcare today. What we can do today and what we will do into the future is mind-boggling. And what drives a lot of this too is consumer expectation. Uh, we expect to be cured, largely. Hep C is a classic. We can, we can provide a drug now, it costs a fortune. It's cost my budget a billion dollars just to get that drug out there into the public so that people can buy it for their $38 or their $6.60. But at the end of that, that course, they can be cured. That is a big thing. And community expectation is that we will actually get there. Now, community more broadly is much more aware, globally aware, technology aware, and that is actually driving a lot of things uh, in our health system. We have a few other complications here. We have a, a state territory commonwealth divide uh, with our federation and some people always try and solve that and uh, to be frank the only way you're going to solve it is to put all our money into research, invent the time machine, go back to 1901 and start again. Because we have a system it's not going to change and we, we need to recognise that and work with the system we have. We have a public-private split and I'll come back to that because I think that's a really important issue for us to really understand. We have a fee-for-service system that is not necessarily helping us, with our, particularly with our chronic and complex patients, because it's transactional in nature. And, these, and most research around chronic and complex patients says facilitation of, a, of care means more than sometimes the care itself, because you've got to get across multiple different areas. We have rural and remote issues, we have primary and acute issues, and they're the ones that uh, the ambulance service in particular see uh, is uh, the issues at hospitals and health services. And to actually move forward, I think we really do need to rethink uh, some of the ways we've traditionally looked at this. If I look at some of the statistics in healthcare, we spend over $160 billion a year on healthcare in Australia. And if we look at it through only one lens, we're missing most of the picture, or a large part of the picture. The Commonwealth, from a funding perspective, puts in about 41%. States and territories put in about 26%. And private sector means either insurance or out-of-pockets is 33%. So we've already chosen the health system uh, we've got, and it is one-third private sector-based. I also know through some, some work around some ambulance areas now, you take at least a third of your patients to a private sector operator, not necessarily a public sector. Now that may not hold across Australia and New Zealand, but we do need to understand that if we don't look at the private sector, we will only come up with two thirds of the answer, and in some cases not even that. 
The work that's happened in, in the public sector, in particular public hospital sector in particular, there's been some really good work uh, around nationally efficient pricing, which has, has driven significant change. It's seen price growth drop from 5.5% to 1.5%, price-only growth, in a matter of about five or six years. Internationally, that is unprecedented. Private sector growth is much, much higher than that, largely because the public sector is a relatively closed group where everything sort of comes together and you can apply those sorts of principles. The private sector, on the other hand, is a disconnected group. The hospitals don't really own the doctors or the devices or the insurers. There's regulators in the middle of it. The private public hospitals now account for about 20 per cent of private activity. The world is shifting as we speak on these topics at the moment, and we really do need to understand where the, where the broad system is going. So I want to just touch on what I've done in the department in the last three years, and uh, because we've been doing a lot of work to try and uh, try and deal with these broad system issues. Health, health reform is long term. It is not short term. We've seen many, many short term fixes put in health care over, over the years that I've been involved in it. Um, it doesn't work for the long term. So you have to think deeply and strongly. Um, what we have done is uh, we've tried to understand the interdependencies in the system. Because if you poke over here, it will pop out somewhere else. And we need to understand that. You see that quite regularly as you wait to get your patients through. So when I was appointed as a Secretary of Health, um, I, I actually set up a group called Strategic Policy and Innovation, quite deliberately to say we need to think deep about, deeply about what we're actually trying to do and how we can actually set, set the system up for the long term. At the centre of that thinking, we put data, analytics, evaluation and research. And that has been our mainstay. And I'll touch on a few things that we've done that really have led to uh, some of the decisions that we've actually made. Um, as I said, our healthcare system is second to none in, in the world. In data, it is absolutely up there. Um, I've, I've had the great opportunity to, to travel to a range of different countries and particularly with the work we do with OECD and the World Health uh, Organization. Uh, we do a lot of work in the US with the Commonwealth Fund and we come out very, very highly uh, in the use of data. Our resources in this country are unbelievable. Our use of those data resources is pretty ordinary. We seem to think it's for one purpose and then forget about the rest, or we don't really understand what we have uh, within our grasp. We need to put that at the centre uh, of our decision making and our policy thinking, not just for operational purposes. So, a little bit of uh, gratuitous advice to start with, and I'll, come, I'll probably give you some more as we go through, but make sure that you use data now for your policy setting. Uh, we have, and we've done some pretty interesting things. We're doing, for, I'll, I'll run through a couple of things that we're doing. Medical benefit schedule, uh, we're having a look at that, uh, and we call it the MBS review group, and they're looking at the appropriateness of, uh, of some of the things, the transactions that happen within the MBS. It is data driven. We're using the data to understand what's actually happening. If you have a look at the Safety and Quality Commission's website, you'll see a thing called the Atlas of Healthcare Variation. Absolutely fascinating that you see things like 16 fold differences in hysterectomy rates, 70 fold difference. In, uh, in some of the um, scope work. There are some suburbs that I won't stand still for fear of getting a scope placed somewhere. <laughs> and that's a worry. We need to really think about these sorts of issues. Use the data. Knee arthroscopies for people 65 and over to diagnose osteoporosis. 
does nothing. Interestingly, we haven't actually stopped that in, in, a, in any legal sense. We started to talk about it and the numbers have gone from very, very high to almost ne uh, negligible because we've started to talk about these issues. The Atlas of Clinical uh, Healthcare Variation now has really started to put a focus on some of these things. The use of psychotropic drugs is another classic. And if we apply the traditional way of thinking about these things, we just make generalisations. Yet you apply socioeconomic status to this, you get completely different pictures for different parts of the community. We need to understand that better. So we're doing a lot of work in that space, all clinician-led. That is the other really important difference is, and I'll come back to talk about collaboration and the stakeholder groups. Healthcare homes is uh, a pilot and trial work that we're going to do around chronic and complex disease. Trying to actually look at that facilitation model. Also having some pretty interesting uh, debates and conversations about how do we fund that's not transaction based. And again facilitation I think is a key and I'll, I would uh, just, I'll come back to it later, but ambulance can and should play a role in those sorts of things. The primary health networks, commissioners of service, quite deliberately trying to get things to a regional level, understand what is happening in that population, understanding the burden of disease and allowing people to make decisions. We're putting pretty much all of our mental health and drug and alcohol money that the Commonwealth puts into the system through our primary health networks. Because what happens in Adelaide is not the same that happens in North Queensland or Sydney or Canberra. We need to understand that local difference. My health record and the digital world, it is the future. Uh, we're moving to an opt-out system for my health record. And if, if uh, we think that's just going to be the be-all and end-all, it's not. What it's going to be, though, is the pipes, the infrastructure and architecture that will actually enable things to happen. We've opened it up to the app world. And there are apps out there now uh, that I can go on my, my mobile phone, tap an app, put my PIN, PIN number in, as long as I've linked it, uh, to my health record or my gov account, I can actually pull up all my transactions in the health system. I can do that now. I'd, I'd show you, except I changed phones on Monday and of course I don't have the app on there anymore. But I, I have actually demonstrated this in, in Berlin, uh, in Geneva, in the US, in a range of places. It is so easy now. It is the future. We've just got to keep moving that agenda forward. Opt-out is really critical in this space. We've had many debates about privacy on this issue and uh, uh, I think we've tackled most of those issues. The trials that we did on, on the opt-out for my health record, a million people, 1.9% opt-out when everyone was telling me it would be between 25 and 50%, 1 1.9%. Um, and there is unanimous support uh, for an opt-out uh, regime. And again, there's a lot of groups that kept saying that would never happen. It is. It's not just a medical record either. It is a record of everything and can be a record of even more. If you fast forward into the wellness world, the, the wearables world, it can and will change the way we actually look at things. I really don't think I can predict what's going to happen in healthcare in the next five to ten years. I can give you a guess, I can talk broadly, but I probably couldn't have picked how the world would have moved in the digital space, you know, the, the Twitter world these days and all the things that go with that. Uh, who would have thought uh, President of the United States' main communication message, uh, method is Twitter? But there you go. Genomics, precision medicine, will really shift the agenda. It's already starting. It is probably the fastest growing uh, technology issue out there today, relies on big use of data again. Uh, but, and we, 
in Australia, again, not a very big country in the overall scheme of things, we are leading in many of these fields. So we've got to keep a real eye on that. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's starting. There's a fair bit of it going on already. We just don't know. Um, there's, there's, uh, there was a thing happening, uh, an exercise happened in the US recently where they're, they're trialling driverless cars, but driverless trucks. And they talked about that as uh, it will do a whole lot of things. Uh, put 11 million truck drivers out of a job. That's where it starts. But it will reduce, reduce accidents, it will reduce deaths on the road, it will reduce a whole lot of things. Now, I think we've got a little way to go to get there, but artificial intelligence will shift our world. There was a report in the paper earlier this week that says by 2030 it will have an impact of about $2.2 trillion on the Australian community and could change the jobs of 3 million people. I don't think we're ready for that, but it's here. It's happening. It's just we've got to really start to think differently if we're going to be successful. So for us, putting stakeholders, getting collaboration activities in place has been quite central uh, to what we've been actually trying to do. My firm view is we need to listen to people. I don't necessarily need to agree with everyone I talk to, but if I don't listen and understand what's going on, I will miss a hell of a lot, in my view. Many of our stakeholders are now acknowledging quite openly that you know, we're probably consulting too much because they can't keep up with us. My view, can never do too much. Because we all have different ways of thinking. We all have different backgrounds. Yours is not the same as mine. Mine's not the same as yours. I'm not more important than you and you're not more important to me. Together, though, my God, we can come up with some interesting ideas. That's how we have to actually start to think about some of these things. Our relationships with the states and territories. Uh, it is probably the best I have actually seen it, uh, you know, even when I was in the state system. The best thing we used to do is kick the Commonwealth. Now I'm in the Commonwealth, it's, you know, it's great. But you have to actively engage. Again, the politics are difficult sometimes. Uh, the issues are different most of the time. But we've actually agreed with the states and territories a strategic long-term vision for the health system. Everyone said that would never happen. It has. We've got all, all of the public servants to agree, all of the politicians to agree. We've actually got that in place and we're progressing a whole range of things there. Providers and big pharma. Um, we've done a lot of work in that space as well. We've, with the last budget, we set up a range of compacts where we got a few nasty issues off the table, uh, the short-term thinking, to be frank, and we've actually got some agreements in place that can really shift that uh, agenda. Consumers, they need to be at the centre of our thinking. We're slowly getting there in places. Healthcare homes is all about that for us. It is about trying to put that patient there right at the centre. Don't put the provider at the centre. So, because what's good for the provider is not always good for the patient in all cases. As I mentioned before, consumer expectation is high. It's shifted quite a bit. We need to keep up with that. But an important thing about consumers, and I, I do see this quite a bit, we look at them as consumers, a group. They are not an homogenous group. If you've ever sat down with health healthcare consumers, uh, you get some pretty interesting perspectives on how they're treated. I, I, probably about 12 months ago, I, I listened to uh, a couple of different versions. One was a woman who was, um, had diabetes for about 30 odd years. She knew her treatment, her disease, back the front. She moved a bit, changed doctors, they'd start from scratch. She tried to tell them they didn't listen. Uh, she became a very strong advocate for consumer-driven uh, health care. Fascinating conversation. She knew more than most on that disease, it, how it related to her. And that was the important difference. 
But then we spoke with a, a young mother whose son, about six year old, was run over by a car in a country town. Uh, ambulance got them to hospital. Uh, things were looking okay. Mum didn't have a clue. Mum was left outside during some of the conversations. Conversations were had that she did not understand. So consumers aren't all the same. So we need to come up with a system that allows us to think like that as well. You will see that. Your customers that you see every day are not the same. And you do need to remember sometimes that uh, your diabetes patient will know more than you about how they are. And that's hard sometimes because you've done a lot of study to get to where you are, as have the doctors and nurses and everyone else who plays in this game. But if you're a long-term sufferer of something, you will pick it up. Now, there might be another person who's had diabetes for 30 years who will have no clue. We've got to recognise that as well. But clearly, the young mum whose kid got run over, she needed a completely different set of help. And we needed to give her that. And I don't think we always, uh, always do that well. So uh, that's a bit of a run through the system, a bit of a run through how we need to really uh, think about that so we can come up with some uh, appropriate solutions in the long term. So how should ambulance be part of this? Um, I'm not going to give you... Uh, you know, anything in particular, because you know your business better than I ever will, as it should be. I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure what the next five to ten years is going to bring. The late 2020s, it's going to be a mystery. I'm of an age, I'll probably be retired, so that'll probably be good. But I do think we have a great opportunity, but I also think we have to think differently. You know, the old paradigms are probably, they'll work in places, they'll work if we tweak them, but we'll have to rethink a whole lot of the models if we're going to do that. I think our, our opportunities, I mentioned a couple earlier, your primary health networks, great opportunity uh, for ambulance services. You might have to think about how you can do that though. They might have to think how they can interact with you. I don't think it's going to necessarily be easy but it is an opportunity. We'll need to think about those. If you think about aged care in that context, how you get dragged into the aged care world a lot, primary health networks may be one of the answers. Healthcare homes, I touched on earlier. If facilitation is going to be important to the care of people with chronic and complex conditions, how does ambulance play a role in that? How many chronic patients do you transport every single day? Are there different ways? And I know you are trialling different ways of looking at that at the moment in, in a number of places. But we've got to think more about that. Technology is changing. Uh, I think the world's information and data resources uh, at the moment are doubling about every two months. So in one year, that's a lot of doubling. So what's going to happen next? How are we actually going to deal with it? How are we going to understand it? Maybe we won't, but we have to be open to it. We have to be open to the use of data, data analytics. Use that not only for your operational purposes of understanding your wait times and your this time and that time, but how do you use it to start to predict activity, predict change, predict things that are happening in, this, in the system. There is a lot happening in the predictive analytics world at the moment. We all need to really think about that. The theme of the conference though, uh, better together, collaboration, integration and partnership for me says it all. That's what you have to use to get the outcomes. We all uh, have a lot of knowledge but individually we're not the font of all knowledge. Collectively, we'll give it a damn good try. So we've got to understand that. As I said, great opportunities. One of the real inhibitors, though, is self-interest. 
I say quite often uh, when people talk to me about stakeholders and the like, there's more stakeholders per square inch in the healthcare space than I've, I've ever come across in any of my past lives. More self-interest as well. So how do we put our self-interest to one side to get you know, the bigger picture? Because I do think together we can actually shift the system. We can improve the services to our communities, which at the end of the day, that's why we all uh, do public service. It is about that broader picture. Otherwise, we'd be doing something else. I think we need to go beyond uh, what you currently see. Get out of that comfort zone occasionally. I quite often say to my people, what you, know, what you see depends on where you sit. So if you keep sitting in the same place, you're going to see the same things. Change position occasionally. Get out, have a look at somehow different, how different worlds actually work. So some of my gratuitous, this is my gratuitous advice time. You need to have courage, though, in this game. And sometimes that's pretty hard. But you have to have the courage to try different things, sometimes to say no. Um, you know, I seem to do that quite a bit, and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's, you have to have the courage if you're going to actually make big change. Keep talking to each other. Um, there is a tendency for us to bunker down when, the, when it gets hard, when the budgets are tight, when all of these things are happening. The reality is, if you keep talking, you keep working with each other, you can come up with, uh, with a better outcome. Uh, embrace difference is another one. We are different. We need to embrace that difference because we will bring uh, a really interesting perspective. Lynn mentioned the steward word. I run very heavily on stewardship because I haven't seen ownership in the health space work that well. People who want to own things. It means you protect it too much. You're not open to change. You're not open to different thinking. And you need to be. So stewardship, for me, uh, is how this world needs to work. It is really quite a fundamental issue for me. I believe, though, uh, we do have some pretty good building blocks. We do have a great health system uh, in this country. I do also believe that the goodwill is there. We've, we've got a whole set of circumstances that will allow us to have these conversations today. I think, though, if we work together, anything is possible. Thank you.